Hey everyone, um, welcome back. <laughs> I haven't done a book video in a little while. Um, we're going to try to do them more regularly this year. Um, things have changed a little bit, so hopefully I will have a little bit of time to do them. Um, the book we're talking about today is this, The Coming of the Third Reich uh, by Richard J. Evans. Um, and this is uh, the first book in a trilogy about the Third Reich. Uh, this is of the first book, Coming of the Third Reich. The second book is The Third Reich in Power. And the last book is uh, The Third Reich at War. And this is the third or fourth time I'm recording this video. My camera seems to be playing up a little bit, so that's a little bit frustrating. Um, but hopefully we'll get through it this time. It might be a little bit of a short video, and I'll try and figure out the camera issues and then fix it um, for the next one so we can do it for a bit longer. Um, so this is a seminal work on Nazi Germany. It's a more, more recent one. Obviously, the other obvious one is the um, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William L. Shira, which was written in the 1960s. And in the preface of this book, Evans talks about that book. Um, he talks about a series of other works that have been done on Nazi Germany as well, and why this book needs to be written, why it's worth writing this book. Um, and so well worth reading the preface. Um, and so in the interest of hopefully not having this um, video fail on me again, I'm just going to dive right into the details. Um, basically, as a broad stroke, this this is a not a, not a specialist book. Um, it is a it's a I, I suppose a popular history book, um, but it's not for maybe the average reader. The average reader can probably find something a bit short, so that's not so deep in the details of everything. Um, but it's really good. It I like that it doesn't focus on Hitler all that often. Maybe like a third of the book focuses on him. Um, and it's nice to see like the rest of what was going on. It's like trying to tell the story of the last eight years in or maybe six years in America only focusing on Trump. Like it wouldn't work. There's a lot more going on. Um, but Trump is an important figure, obviously. Um, and so, and I don't say that to draw a parallel between Hitler and Trump. I just say that, like, Trump's a, a big figure in America right now, um, but it would be incorrect only to focus on him. Um, so this is broken up into six parts. The first part is a legacy of the past, and basically what we get here is a discussion about the um, Bismarckian era, um, and what people thought of the Bismarckian era sitting in like the 1920s. Um, and so we, we find out about like Bismarck and this myth of Bismarck that gets created of him being like a, a very strong leader um, who was able to bring Germany onto the world stage in a real way. And this is what people want in the 1920s after the whole stab in the back myth um, and how the war was lost. Um, and so, yeah, you obviously you get some discussion of the stab in the back myth, um, and you get the discussion of the anti-Semitism. And in here, there's some quite gross uh, characters that you meet, um, who are these anti-Semites. Um, I, I keep forgetting the guy's name every time I, I read. Houston Stewart Chamberlain. Um, he writes a book called The Foundations of the 19th Century. Um, and that's basically an anti-Semitic book. And it's one of the texts that everybody ends up um, basing their basing their anti-Semitism anti and their politics that are based around anti-Semitism. They base it on that book. Um, and so you, you get an exploration of how the anti-Semitism is brewing in Germany and, and how that intersects with German nationalism as well. Um, then part two talks about, it's called the failure of democracy, and it basically talks about the Weimar constitution and how it was a bad constitution, um, or maybe not necessarily a bad constitution, but the um, article, I think it's article 48, I always forget it, I've got it noted here as article 48, but that could definitely be wrong. Basically this is the article in the constitution that gives the president emergency powers. So he can declare, or he can get an emergency declared, um, and then he can rule by decree, basically. Um, and the first 
Reich president, President Ebert, uses this a lot. Um, as we can see in current times, um, parliamentary systems are frustrating um, and they're difficult to get things done. And that's for a reason. Um, and Germany isn't ready for that, I think, at the time. And so Ebert gets frustrated and he keeps using these emergency powers. So he sets a precedent that it's okay to use the emergency powers, even if it's not an emergency. Um, and then when President Paul von Hindenburg comes to power, he's a guy in his 80s, um, he doesn't have the patience to work with the Reichstag to get things done, so he uses it as well. And then it, it just basically sets this precedent that it's okay to sort of do these things that are kind of shifty in terms of democracy. Um, it erodes that culture of democracy um, over time. Um, and I think it's important when you look at when Hitler comes to power, the things that he does to cement his power. Um, and then obviously you have to talk about the economy at this time. Um, in the early 1920s, you have that hyperinflation that's like partly caused by the reparations payments. It's, it's caused by a series of things. Um, and this isn't an economics book. It doesn't really dive too deeply into that. Um, for those who may, maybe are new here, I have an economics degree. Um, and that makes me a little bit nervous to talk about um, the hyperinflation um, just because it's, it's such a um, kind of a t controversial subject whenever inflation and hyperinflation come up. It's a little bit controversial um, and I don't want to say anything that's like wrong. Um, but yeah, basically this hyperinflation happens and basically for those who maybe aren't uh, too up to speed on economics, uh, inflation is the increasing price of goods and we see this in the world every day. But this hyperinflation is when like there's a noticeable change in the price of goods like even on a like daily basis or hourly basis. And I think there's there's an anecdote in here of someone sitting down for a cup of coffee um, and, and like she sits down, she gets told the price of her coffee. And then when she gets up to go and pay for it, the price has changed and it's gone up by like a third or something stupid. And obviously this causes issues. It makes any savings anyone has completely worthless. Um, it tells the story of how like people would get paid. And then like if you're getting paid like on a monthly basis, for example, you can't hold on to that money because you're not going to be able to buy anything at the end of the month. So people would get paid and then they'd like run to the shops and try and buy everything they need for the next month. Um, and so in this situation, you're buying foods that aren't as good. You can't buy fresh food. Um, maybe for like a little bit, you can have fresh food in the first few days of the month. But then the rest of the time, you've got to be eating something else. It's causing massive, massive issues. And everybody's affected in some way by it. But they're affected at different times. And so everyone thinks that in some way everybody else is not being affected by it. Um, and obviously it destroys the economy. It puts this um, unemployment into into the, the system um, that doesn't ever really get taken out properly um, until like after the war really. Um, but it starts this sort of system of unemployment um, at, the, at that time. Um, and then we also get here the, um, the stab in the back myth explored in a little bit more detail. And the reason it gets explored here is that we talk about the difference between Germany and the Weimar Republic. Um, and it's important to sort of think about it because you have this German nationalism that gets built up and in particular these people who are either in the military or in the civil service um, who basically what they have made their careers working for for Germany and then they get forced to work for this Weimar Republic um, and that's not what they and the Weimar Republic wasn't sort of the what people saw as Germany they saw it as sort of something that was forced upon them after the stab in the back by these elites um, and basically um, 
it didn't have the le legitimacy as being an actual government. Even within the government, it didn't have that legitimacy um, that it really needed. And if you think about like the the United States now, people don't separate America and the American government all that much. Um, like the American patriotism is <laughs> patriotism for the Constitution, um, whereas here it's totally different. Like the Constitution is something that's like pasted on top of what they're actually patriotic for. Um, and so you see this sort of weakening of the system because of that. Like people don't want to defend Weimar democracy. Um, and so from, from the start, Weimar democracy is, is almost doomed to fail. And then you see some like political violence and like the culture wars take over in the early 1920s as well. And then part three, he devotes to the rise of Nazism. Um, this is where you start to see the major plays. You sort of get like the rotating cast of everyone, um, who they were, where they came from, all of this. Um, and I think importantly, Hitler's not discussed first here. Um, because the Nazi movement is not Hitler's movement necessarily. It becomes Hitler's movement for sure. But it wasn't Hitler's movement at first. Um, and so you start to see this and where they come from. Um, they are these anti anti-Semites, these racist, horrible people who start to band together and really feel that the Weimar democracy is the reason why things are bad in Germany. Um, and so you see them in 1923 try the, the Beer Hall Putsch, where they, they try to take over um, by force, um, modelling themselves based on the march on Rome that Mussolini did, um, and it fails. Um, they weren't sort of organised enough, and it, it didn't work. And so you see this commitment to do it through the demo democratic means to come to power. And in part four, you start to see that towards the seizure of power. And I thought that this was the strongest part of the book. It read like a thriller. Um, you read about the elections and the different strategies of how the Nazis were trying to get elected. Um, you see this there's during the uh, elections in the early 1930s, you see Hitler flying around Germany in what... Evans describes as a, an American presidency style campaign. Um, he's flying around Germany doing several speeches a day at these rallies. Basically, like it's not different to what you see people doing now um, in America. Um, and so you see this electoral strategy, but the electoral strategy doesn't only happen in the Reichstag, and uh, obviously Hitler runs for president at one point. Um, you see it at all levels. You see it in the student councils. You see it in the... They sort of try to get into the labour movement. They try to get into the women's leagues. They, everywhere, they are trying to get involved and try to get elected and to, to control. Um, and so throughout the late 1920s and early 1930s, this is what they're trying to do. And it reads really, really well. Um, I won't go into the details of like all the who the cabinets were and who the chancellors were and you can read the book if you want to get all that but basically that's what it's talking about here um that they are using the democratic or the the electoral processes throughout the country at all levels um so state or yeah the state governments the um the Reichstag, the presidency, the student unions, everywhere. They are just trying to get elected. And slowly you see their vote numbers go up until late 1932. They get like 30% of the vote or 34% of the vote. I forget the exact numbers. It's all explored really well in this part of the book. Um, and then in late 1932, then you get into this point where the Reichstag can't do... Okay, this thing keeps stopping on me. I don't know why. Um, I don't know what we've seen, but basically towards the end of 1932, you have like three or four elections happening. Um, they can't get a government together that's going to be stable and that's going to work. Um, and the last election, the Nazis are gaining and gaining and gaining. They come up to like 34% of the votes. Um, and with the nationalists, they can form a government, a coalition government. 
And so Hindenburg appoints uh, Hindenburg appoints Hitler as the chancellor um, in this coalition government, and they think that they can control Hitler. Um, and Evans argues in here that had Hitler not been appointed chancellor at this point, maybe the Third Reich doesn't happen. Um, because Hitler, if we go back to the beginning, when we're talking about Hitler building himself on Bismarck's like sort of mythology, um, he needs to be seen as a strong leader. And if he wasn't appointed to the government as the leader of the government, certainly um, that would have that idea of him would have been diminished. Um, and so I think that that's really important. Um, that's a really important point there. Um, and so you see Hitler get appointed as chancellor. And then we move into the final two chapters where, um, so final two parts. Part five is creating the Third Reich. And this is where you start to see the Third Reich that we know start to develop. So you start to see the terror. He's crushing the his political opponents, so the communists, the social democrats, um, using the brown shirts and the SS, um, so the SA and the SS, to do this. Um, they are infiltrating their... Do, they're doing these... Like, basically, there, there's, there's more elections in 1933, even after he's elected chancellor. And the Nazis know at this point that their, their popularity is starting to decrease. And so they need to start cementing power in a way that is outside of what they have been doing. And so they have to start reducing the ability for other people to get elected. Um, and so they start basically intimidating people um, and using the paramilitary force of the SA to do that. Then you have the Reichstag fire, um, which Hitler blames on the communists um, and gets emergency powers to basically rule by decree uh, to crush his enemies. Um, and this is the beginning of the end. Um, and then a few months later, you get the Enabling Act, which again, just basically gives Hitler the power to rule by decree. And by the end of the book, President Hindenburg is dead and Hitler combines the office of the president and the chancellor to basically create the leader. Um, and he becomes the only person that matters in Nazi Germany. Um, and part six is a little bit superfluous, but I think um, it talks about Hitler's cultural revolution and how he, I think it sets up the next book really well, where he talks about how now that Hitler had power, he needed to hold on to it. And the only way he could do that was by getting everybody on board with the Nazi plan. Um, and so that's where he talks about how he changes the music scene, he changes the art scene, he changes movies. Um, but this is explored in a lot more detail in the second volume. So I'll leave talking about that to, to the video on that. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Um, this is my first time really doing a book like a book uh, video like this. So if you like it, um, please um, let me know. Um, and hopefully I'll be back soon with uh, the Third Reich in power. And then we'll do the Third Reich at war after that. So thanks for watching. Um, I'll see you soon.